we begin the study of the seventh lesson of the Foundation Bible class, the new birth. Jesus says in John 3.3, 3, ye must be born again. When a person is born again, he becomes a new man. Spiritual life comes with the new birth. It signifies the beginning of spiritual life. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells such a man. Ephesians 1 verse 13 tells us, In whom also after ye believed, ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. According to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. In the new birth, one is cleansed from the inward, the filthiness of sin. This is what is described as the washing of regeneration. And Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 5 tells us that one who is born again is being quickened, is being made alive. Before we were dead in sins and trespasses, we have no spiritual life. Um, when we walk after the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we had our conversation in the past, in times past, in the last of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. In other words, we are hated for God's judgment. But God, who is rich in His mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. Before the new birth, we were dead in trespasses and sins. The analogy is that the dead person can only rot. Right? A person, when he's dead, right? the body will decompose. But when a person is made alive, he sees the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which God shined upon his heart. John described it this way in John chapter 3, verse 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. We cannot choose to believe in God when we are dead in trespasses and sins, because we hate the light, neither come to the light. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 to 6, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not. So before we are saved, our minds are blinded by the God of this world. <clears throat> Lest the light of the glorious gospel, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God commendeth the light to shine out of darkness and has shined into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So how can we be saved? God has to shine the light of the gospel into our hearts. And when this is done, you will find that there is a change. As a result of the new birth, we begin to understand spiritual things. Such a person become a believer in the true sense of the word. The Apostle Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 to 12, when he says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So the new birth, receiving spiritual life, enables one to see and enter the kingdom of God. He becomes a citizen of God's kingdom. And Jesus explains this truth to Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3. And he says this in verse 3 to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus asked him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of a spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Jesus distinguished the physical life from the spiritual life. When we are born into this world, we have physical life. When we are born of the Spirit, we receive spiritual life. We can understand spiritual things. So how can a man receive spiritual life? Except a man be born of water and of a spirit. To this end, the reformer John Calvin explained well that no man is a son of God until he has been renewed by water and that this water is the Holy Spirit which cleanses us anew and who by spreading His energy over us imparts to us the vigour of the heavenly life though by nature we are utterly dry. So the Holy Spirit comes and renews us, cleanses us anew, spreading His energy over us, imparting to us the vigour of heavenly life though by nature we are utterly dry. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 to 6. For God commanded lights to shine out of darkness and has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And here the Lord shows us. And so the first lesson, so the Lord wants us to see and the Lord wants us to understand and know Him. Right? And... John 3 verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, how can we be born of the Spirit? How can we have spiritual life? So, faith comes by hearing, and the hearing, the Word of God. The new birth is effected by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the Word of God, especially that of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of God. Jesus Christ, which produces faith. The preaching of the gospel by the mighty working of the Holy Spirit produces faith as the, Holy, as the Apostle Paul explains that brings about the new birth in his own conversion and in the conversion of others. So he says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you which also I have ye have received, and herein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Jesus, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." And as Moses was lifted up, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Just as Moses, God instructed Moses to make a brazen serpent and lift it up high so that the Israelites who were bitten by the poisonous snakes in the wilderness, seeing were healed. So everyone, every man who looks to Jesus lifted up upon the cross to be sacrificed for his sins, received the forgiveness of sins. A person in a dark room cannot see anything until he finds the light switch and the light is switched on. Suddenly, we say, ding! 
the light shines through the darkness, and all that is, a room, that is in the room is clearly seen, that ye should show forth the praises of Him, of Christ, who has called you out of darkness into His marvellous light. This is a picture of the spiritual rebirth. The demeanour of such a person who receives the new birth is blessed with the humility of spirit. How can we come to know God, receive this new birth? Well, we, God must give us a humility of spirit to admit our spiritual poverty, that we need help and our utter disability to save ourselves and order our lives, our own lives. And we have a mourning for our sins leading to repentance. Jesus says, the first thing he, he taught when He came upon earth, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The proud man cannot enter heaven, and only the lowly, the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The first lesson in Jesus' school of theology is to acknowledge our spiritual bankruptcy. We cannot approach God except by humbling ourselves before God to acknowledge our total depravity. And this is the meaning of being poor in spirit. It is the first step towards receiving God's favour. Listen carefully to our Saviour's words and pray that we can understand this first law of His kingdom. Only Jesus has the power to break the whole of pride and self in our lives. May we plead with Him to humble us that we may truly be blessed of Him. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. The battle within the heart is so intense and so real. For our natural self will resist the denying of self. We are a self-righteous people. Right? In driving, the term used is our blind spot. A blind spot is the, the you know, when you're driving, the part that you cannot see. Uh, the part you cannot see. We can see the fault of others, but we cannot see our own depravity. God has to deliberately confront us to help us to see our depravity. So poverty in, of spirit is therefore the condition of the heart which has been touched by the Holy Spirit to know the truth. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is the abode of the poor in spirit. Heaven is the realm of God, the abode of God. So theirs simply means belonging to them. This is the glad tidings there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the glad tiding that Jesus is proclaiming. The humble in heart has his permanent residence with God. This is the prerequisite or condition, the heart condition needed for entrance to this blessed residence. The ruler of the kingdom is God himself, visibly represented by his son, Jesus Christ, the king. The subjects of the kingdom are characterized by being poor in spirit. These are the ones who will humble themselves to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Jesus says, The kingdom of God is within you, for God rules in the heart of every born-again believer who acknowledges His headship or His kingship. Yet the kingdom of God is termed as a heavenly kingdom to emphasize the universal, unseen, and sovereign reign of God over His creation. Jesus came from heaven to give a place in heaven to all who will receive Him. John 3 verse 15. Jesus claims, proclaims that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's pointing His listeners to the cross where He will die and shed His blood for the remission of their sins. All who acknowledge their hopeless and lost estate will be saved. All who humble themselves to receive Him will be blessed. This is the privilege of the repentant thief who acknowledge his utter hopelessness. Jesus pronounced upon him this blessing. Verily I say unto you, 
to thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So Spurgeon, the preacher of old, observed well, he says, in godly sorrow, a man's heart empties itself before God. Then Christ empties his heart out to supply the needs of his poor, sorrowing child. In confessing to Christ our deficiencies, he reveals to us his fullness. When we tell Jesus our sorrows, he tells us his joys. We tell him our sins, and he tells us his righteousness. Mourners are promised the blessing of God's comfort. Indeed, they shall be comforted. So what is Christianity? Christianity is a relationship between man and God. And sin results in a broken relationship. However, Jesus, the great physician, can mend his, this broken relationship. This is the good news. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus brings peace to all who will receive him and his message. So Jesus says to you, repent for the kingdom of Heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, verse 17. These, there are two things to do about the gospel. To believe it, Susanna Wesley says, and behave it. So we, say, we, we mentioned how to, be, how to receive, how can a man receive spiritual life? Right? Secondly, to be born of the Spirit. It is to be born of the Spirit. Verse 8 of John chapter 3 says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus explained the new birth. As one who is born of the Spirit, he likens the Holy Spirit in effecting the new birth to the wind that is invisible to the sight, and yet its effect can be felt. Right? You cannot see the wind. But when the wind is blowing, you can feel the, that the wind is there, isn't it? So this is the same with the Holy Spirit. Just as the kite is lifted up into the air by the wind and the presence of the wind is seen by the kite flying in the air, so is the Holy Spirit's presence. Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus, How can these things be? And Jesus said to him, Art thou a master of Israel? Knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So Jesus is able to explain the matters of the soul and the place of the permanent abode of the soul in heaven because He is sent by the Father from heaven to explain to us these heavenly things. So here the Lord wants us to see right, that when we receive, humble ourselves and receive the work of Christ, His atonement for our sins and to repent of our sins, then the Bible tells us that we receive God's best gift to men. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Man has three problems he cannot solve. Of sin, we see that this world is plagued by hatred and violence right from the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden. The first family was broken because the elder brother killed the younger brother. It was meant to be a beautiful home. Father, mother and two sons, Cain and Abel. But what happened? And that began the history of violence, the history of hatred, the history of calamity among men. And it is observed in the last 4,000 years, of human history, there is less than 300 without a major war. And if you analyse the human situation, the world political situation, you will realise that it is quite worrying, isn't it? Right? We are seeing war clouds all over again. It tells us the problem that is plaguing men, 
the problem that is within him that he cannot solve. What is wrong with the human heart? I submit to you that it is the problem called sin. A nature that man has inherited when the first man, Adam, departed from obeying God, the God who made him, the God who placed him in a paradise, and he gave it all to the devil, to Satan. With sin comes sorrow. He cannot avoid it. Grief is an inevitable result of this fallen world, broken relationships, broken family bonds, broken marital bonds plagued by our human, ex- plagued our human existence. Somehow, we just don't know how to live peaceably, joyfully with one another. What is wrong with us? How is it that we cannot, much as we try, what is that missing ingredient in our lives? And to top it all, sin, sorrow, then comes death. When it's so inevitable, none can escape. Ten out of ten will die. When death strikes in a family, the entire family sorrows for the departed one. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2 says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of fisting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. We are awakened to the reality of life, and we are awakened to the sad plight of men. If there is no remedy, no hope, that men will solve his problems This that we have identified for you, where is the solution? Dear friends, the Bible is the only book that has solution to the problem of sin, sorrow and death. We have to go back to the maker who has the instructions, who has the specifications. And this is the good news from our scripture text in John 3, 16. There is (laughs) indeed a a solution to sin, sorrow and death. And this is the divine cure for mankind's three problems that he cannot solve. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the good news for us in a nutshell. Simply placed and well spoken. Notice the use of the word perish that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Here the text tells us that the perishing of men in suffering and the perishing of men in the reality of death, how it is a cold, hard, cruel truth that we don't have a solution. Not even the best scientists today and the perishing men or the perishing of men, the Bible reveals to us it's not just sin, sorrow and death in this physical life, This weak body that we have, the inevitable weakness of disease and sickness, has a deeper and more significant consequence and impact that is beyond this life. And the Bible tells us of the consequences of judgment in hellfire for eternity after death. And this is what John is speaking about here. When we believe in the good news of the gospel, we are we avert. The wrath of hellfire. The Bible gives to us the truth concerning the frightening prospect of death. And it requires that we be very truthful to share with you what God's Word says concerning the afterlife so that we may not have any illusion or wrong notion where we are going if we are not, we have not life in Jesus Christ. Therefore, This frightening prospect we want to bring before you as a foreground that men without God would perish in eternal judgment of hellfire. And what is hell like? The Bible tells us it is a place of eternal emotional torment, eternal physical torment. This is the condition of men without God. No hope, no future, no joy, realistically speaking. Everything else man has tried and found wanting in man's effort to save himself. The eternal God who made us and saw how men have fallen to such misery and sadness. So think carefully about where we are going, where you are going. 
And the Bible reveals a truth that we cannot get anywhere else and inevitable that will come upon us when death strikes. But death has lost its sting because of what Jesus, what God had done. This is the good news. God wants us to see that there is an escape, a way out. There's a remedy that is given in God's word. John 3.16 tells us that God loves you. God sent His Son to save you. And God desires that you receive eternal life by faith. This is God's gift to men. And this is a gift we want to bring before you, especially during, uh, now we are entering the Christmas season, to remember the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you see the world celebrate Christmas with their carols and their shopping and their feasting, we want to remember the child who was born in the manger. How God loves you and the love that God gives to you to bring before you the greatness of it. How great was God's love for mankind. God's love was not mere talk, but it was an action word. It speaks of strong affection and it speaks of the will to carry through that love. This is a progression of thought that we want to bring before you that God loves you. He knows that which is going on in your life. He comes to you with such greatness of love. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This love is highly sacrificial, and this love was very costly. When God created the heaven and the earth, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, were there in a perfect union, that perfect relationship. There, the Father, together with the Son and the Spirit, there was fullness of joy. It was a fullness of peace, a fullness of the wonder of wonders when the Godhead created. We are so thrilled by what God has done when we read the Genesis account of God's creation. Isn't it? When God created the entire universe, what was the focus? The earth was the focus. And when God created the earth, He populated the earth, what was the focus? Man was the focus. We are the most important of all of God's creation in the whole universe because we are made in the image of God. But man fell and God had to send His Son to be that solution. It was, a high, it was highly costly and sacrificial move when God sent His only begotten Son. Why did God have to send His Son? It was to pay the price we cannot pay for our sins. When God spoke to Abraham and gave to him the son Isaac, and God asked him to bring his son to Mount Moriah, as he would ask that Abraham would sacrifice his son, as you read that passage of Scripture and you observe how Abraham was to, so deliberate and obedient to the command of God, it's a difficult thing to sacrifice his own son, isn't it? But our text tells us God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. The, only, the word begotten, only begotten means not created. Jesus was there in the beginning where the Father, with the Father from the beginning of no beginnings, and what happened? God had to send His Son in order to offer, to provide the solution, to solve man's problem of sin, sorrow, and death. That's what God wants us to see. God loves you is a truth that brings before you, leading us to the second thought. God sent His Son to save you, to let you know that something has taken place 2,000 years ago. When God sent His Son, in fact, right at the beginning when men fell, the redemption plan of God had begun. The Bible says in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. How the solution would be the seed of the woman. Mary, the mother of Jesus, received Jesus as a virgin, conceived Jesus as a virgin. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that brought about that con conception. We have heard of the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman is unheard of without the taint of human sin. Jesus was born of a virgin. 
This was the only begotten Son of God. Jesus had no sin. He was the one that's being prophesied in the Scripture that the Father has sent in order to fulfill that redemption plan for mankind. And so you notice that Abraham had to sacrifice his son Isaac. He found it so difficult, but he knew that by faith, that the Lord will provide a way out indeed. A goat was caught in the thicket to be that substitute. And so Isaac did not have to die. But when the Father in heaven sent his son, the son had to go to the cross and that was the strength of love. It was painful. The triune relationship between the father and the son saw that the mom, that moment of separation when the father had to allow the son to be crucified on the cross between heaven and earth and the sins of the world were upon him and Jesus died to bear our, bear our sins. Your sins and my sins. God loved you and He provided His Son to save you. And that is a great mystery of mysteries. How in a moment, in those six hours when the sky changed, suddenly changed, the entire atmosphere became dark from 6, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. And there Jesus bore the sins of the world. In that six hours, can you understand that? The sins of the world. It is as if you put a magnifying glass and the glass is focused upon the sunlight and it hit a particular spot. The intensity of the heart will finally burn the surface in which it is focused upon. And that was that sacrifice, that love that brought that sacrifice. And we want us to see, to let you know that there is indeed a solution to sin, sorrow and death. God had given the solution. And because He loved you, therefore He sent His Son to save you. And God desires you to receive eternal life by faith. And the Bible tells us thirdly, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. The phrase there is unique and in the original, the grammar tells us that you shall not perish, you shall not surely perish, you will never perish by the power of the omnipotent God you will be saved. There is a solution if you would only believe. God wants us to have faith in this simple message of salvation. That's our third thought. God desires that you receive eternal life by faith. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This life is not just for this moment. When Christ died for us, He did not just give us a clean slate, but He cleansed us from all our sins and gave us a full slate. He gives us the fullness of the Holy Spirit to live this life well. He gives us the fullness of the Holy Spirit to overcome sin. The Bible tells us that He that is born twice, born of physical life and born of spiritual life, will die only once, the physical death. But he that is born once will die twice. He that is born only with a physical life, without the spiritual life, will die the spiritual, the physical death, and then the spiritual death, the eternal death. So the solution to man's problem is the spiritual rebirth. See? So that we would be saved from the spiritual death, the eternal death. And this is the solution that is given from the Word of God, that God, because of His love, has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save you. Jesus means Saviour. And the word Christ, He is the Mashiach. He is the Anointed One, the One that God has revealed who will save you and give you eternal life. The gift of God to men was His Son. Whosoever would believe in what He has done for us, how He has lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years without sin, obeying all the law when He was crucified upon the cross, how He took our sins and died. He died and was buried. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. No man has ever ri risen from the dead except Jesus Christ to live forever. And we look forward to the day when the Father would send the Son to receive His church. All born-again believers will go to heaven 
And the Bible tells us that we do not have to sorrow for the dead in Christ as those who would die without Christ. As those who would die without Christ. Those who die in Christ, the Bible tells us, is but asleep. A day soon coming when God will raise the dead to life with a glorified body. And that is the precious truth that we comfort one another. We know that there is an everlasting life that we can look forward to. So when we face the trials of life, of sin, of sorrow, of eventually death, we realize that there is an escape. God has given us that solution. If you will not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, if you have not received Jesus Christ and your, as your Lord and Saviour, receive Him today. And if you have received Jesus Christ, then be an ambassador for Him to share this good news to a dying world. You know that this world is seriously in need of a solution to its problems. Right? The war clouds are coming again. And Christianity is the only solution. And you are the privileged people with the message of salvation. God has opened your spiritual eyes and God will strengthen you will, through His Word and by His Spirit open the eyes of others by His grace as you go with the Gospel so as we conclude this message. God's best gift to men. We want to recall and recount God's love for us. Because He loved us, Therefore, He saved us. And we know how we are saved through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we receive faith when we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, that gives to us life everlasting. We marvel at how God gives life to us. And we just want to thank Him and praise Him for all that He has done for us. May God bring each one of us to be ambassadors for Him to our loved ones, to the people around us, that we may see the cry, that they may see the Christ in us. They may see the change. They may see the good news that indeed when they see us, they see the good news, that we are the news, good news to them. We are a blessing to them. May God indeed use us, transform us for His glory. Finally, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and the world loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought with God, in God, coming to the light, receiving the gift of God's love, Jesus Christ, to be delivered from evil and darkness, to receive eternal life is the greatest blessing. Paul says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The hymn, Christ liveth in me, is a lovely hymn that describes this new life in Christ. Once far from God, and dead in sin, no light my heart can see. But God's word, the light I found, now Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation that Christ liveth in me. As rays of light from yonder sun, the flowers of earth set free. So life and light and love came forth from Christ dwelleth in me. As lives the flower within the seed, as in the corn the tree. So praise the God of truth and grace. His spirit dwelleth in me. With all my longing, 
my, with, all, with longing all my heart is filled, that like him I may be, and on the wondrous thought I dwell, that Christ liveth in me. If you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ, this new life is for ours when we would come to Him, when we would humble ourselves and repent of our sins, confess in prayer of our sins, and receive Jesus Christ into our hearts as Lord and Saviour. May the Lord be gracious to save. Let us pray. Father, we come before Thee asking for Thy mercy to save. I pray that all who hear under the sound of the gospel may be convicted of their sins and come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May Thou wrought a work of salvation, a work of mercy to open the spiritual life of such ones who are still outside Thy kingdom that may, may receive this new life in Christ, this new birth. For Thy own mercy's sake, hear our prayer. This I ask with thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.